this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP EMED PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the business document section on the ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN website. Dr. Ben Cogwood, he is one of the current PGY2 Emergency Medicine Pharmacy residents at St. Joseph's Candler Hospital. And today he will be presenting his journal article titled Restrictive Fluids versus Standard Care in Adults with Sepsis in the ED, the Refaced Trial. Uh, so Beck, whenever you're ready, feel free to share your slides. I'll reintroduce the name of this trial as we get going, you know, through the background of this presentation. But it, like Kyle said, this is the Reface trial. My name is Beck. Again, I am the PGY2 Emergency Medicine Pharmacy Resident at St. Joseph's Candler in Savannah. Special thanks to Devin Burrow, who's actually in on the call right now. One of my mentors helped me out with this presentation tremendously. So again, I don't have anything to disclose, um, neither does Devin, for any conflict of interest related to this presentation. And quickly, we'll run through some introduction, and I, I kind of want to touch on sepsis and basically what, what that means for us as clinicians. And I kind of separate it out into two different pillars. We have this life-threatening organ dysfunction that is usually a response to some kind of infectious source, right? So there is um, organ dysfunction that is caused by a response to an infection. And so there are lots of different ways that we can diagnose or screen patients for severity in sepsis. And I'll briefly go over some of those guideline recommendations. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign came out with new guidelines back in 2021, uh, recommending not necessarily one single scoring tool for severity in sepsis. However, they did recommend the service criteria if you were going to use one scoring tool for severity over the QSOFA score especially. But again, no one screening tool is going to be preferred over another in terms of screening for sepsis and severity. And then looking at different laboratory values that we can utilize in the diagnosis of sepsis in the emergency department, especially for us here in emergency medicine, uh, would be a lactate level. I know a lot of our physicians use it, uh, helps predict sepsis diagnosis and severity of sepsis as well. And so that's something we can couple with our scoring system in order to help screen these patients uh, and see who would be adequate for fluid resuscitation, as well as antibiotics and, and those sorts of things as we get down that treatment pathway. So a little more on the sepsis scoring tools themselves. I broke out the SOFA score and the SERS criteria as well, just so we could see the different components. If you're unfamiliar, you see platelets and bilirubin, as well as markers of end organ dysfunction like creatinine, urine output, glass calcoma score. Those are all included in that SOFA severity scale. And then SERS criteria, including temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, and white blood cells. If you have two or more of those, we typically will screen these patients and say that they have a more severe septic workup or septic profile whenever they present to the emergency department. And then very quickly, we know that resuscitation or fluid resuscitation with IV crystalloids is going to be the backbone of our therapy for patients that present to the emergency department with a septic picture. And there are lots of different ways that we can actually monitor patients for fluid responsiveness and exactly how well that resuscitation is working for them. Uh, there are static measures like temperature, skin modeling, capillary refill time, lactate levels, uh, but the guidelines actually do prefer those dynamic measures. And they specifically mention things like the passive leg raise, looking at cardiac output specifically, as well as pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation. And so just keep these in mind as you're looking at fluid responsiveness in terms of this study, because I think it's important to, to bear in mind as we, we get going. So that leads us really to the guideline recommendation back in 2021 that was published by the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. And that was that anyone who presents to the emergency department with sepsis-induced hypoperfusion or septic shock should receive at least 30 mils per keg of isotonic crystalloids. So things like normal saline or lactated ringers, even plasmolite if your institution does have it, but this study specifically mentions lactated ringers as well as normal saline, but that these fluids should be given within the first three hours of resuscitation. So I quickly wanted to dive into some of the background of where that number came from and exactly how we got to that approximately in those guideline recommendations. So we can trace all the way back to 2001 with a study by Rivers et al. that looked at early goal-directed therapy, what they coined it. So I'll draw your attention to the middle of this graphic, to this flow chart that you see down here in the middle, to CVP, where we see central venous pressure. Central venous pressure is mentioned specifically by the SSC 2021 guidelines for static measures of uh, fluid resuscitation and fluid responsiveness. And you can see there that offshoot on the right side, crystalloid fluids and colloid fluids. In this study, 
the clinicians gave the patient population in question uh, 500 mil boluses of fluid in order to keep CVP between eight and 12 millimeters of mercury. And so this was kind of the, one of those first studies that, that really was a landmark in, in terms of sepsis and exactly leading us down the pathway of fluid resuscitation with crystalloid fluid as well. And we can fast forward many, many years up into where we get to the 2021 20, recommendations and where those numbers actually come from, that 30 mil per kilogram number. The guidelines do mention these three specific trials by name when talking about that specific amount in weight-based dosing. So the PROCESS trial, the ARISE trial, the PROMISE trial, they all utilize that early goal-directed therapy, basically getting fluids into patients as fast as we can within those first three hours uh, when they present to the emergency department. So I did include those median fluid volumes administered. Those will be important to keep in mind as we get uh, going with this study and breaking it down a little bit. But I'll draw your attention too to the ARISE trial, and that was published in 2014. Looking at numbers and weight-based doses that are pretty similar to that 30 mil per kg isotonic crystalloid bolus that, that the guidelines do suggest in 2021. But then we can introduce some controversy as well. So we know that the, there are some trials that came after that, and certainly as we get more recent to 2021 itself. But there was a study by QTAB et al. that was also mentioned in the guidelines utilizing this 30 by 3 approach. So 30 mils per kilogram of IV crystalloid resuscitation within three hours, as you can see there under that treatment column. And the results of that study were that those patients that didn't actually receive that amount of fluid within those first three hours saw increased in hospital mortality, increased delayed hypotension, and increased ICU length of stay for those patients that actually required intensive care. And so that's really where the backbone of that recommendation came from, although that trial was retrospective in nature. We can go backward in time a little bit where the controversy really starts coming in, where we see early goal-directed therapy, crystalloid fluid resuscitation in the Kelm at all study that you see there, those patients that did receive early goal-directed therapy saw increased fluid overload, increased in-hospital mortality. And so it raised the question of what amount is best for our patients to get whenever they come into the emergency department and are resuscitated with fluids in a septic workup or a septic profile, right? And then as we get even further down the road in 2022 and now 2023 with the CLOVERS trial, we can see more studies comparing prospectively fluid restriction versus more liberal approaches in terms of resuscitation and looking specifically at the effect on mortality, looking at vasopressor use, death from any cause at 90 days, as you can see there in the classic and Clovers trial. So it'll be interesting to see as we continue to evaluate that Clovers trial that just was published in January of this year. And so you can see those median fluid amounts there, those mean fluid amounts included and that the restrictive fluid group actually did have earlier and longer vasopressor use associated with their treatment course rather than a more liberal fluid resuscitation strategy and death from any cause, although was not statistically significant between groups. And so where this study, the REFACE trial fits into the picture is that we are now looking at emergency department patients in that initial bolus and what is appropriate for these patients and isn't it appropriate for everyone. Those trials that I mentioned, the classic trial, Clover's trial, all were for patients that had already received fluids in some capacity prior to randomization. So they've already gotten fluids, but what do, they, what do we want to do in terms of resuscitation at the beginning whenever a patient gets to the emergency department? And so that was the question that this trial attempted to answer and, and really was more of a feasibility trial. So again, the REFACE trial written by Jessen et al. As we get into the study designed for this study, it was an investigator-initiated, multi-center, randomized, parallel group, open-label feasibility trial. This was located in Denmark at several hospitals there. It was a prospective trial, like I mentioned and the purpose of this study was to test if a restrictive IV fluid protocol in ED patients with sepsis without shock is feasible, and if it could decrease the volume of IV fluids administered compared to standard care. So you see the purpose there, and keep that in mind as we get going. So I will start with the poll question. Does your institution currently restrict fluid resuscitation in certain septic patients? And that's yes or no. So I'm seeing lots of yeses as they come in. I think it's obviously appropriate in certain clinical cases, right? We have patients that are more likely to be fluid overloaded, like if someone has chronic kidney disease, if they have congestive heart failure, we might be more wary of that, more cognizant of that as we're resuscitating them based on comorbidities. Elderly patients as well could fit into that picture. So all things to consider as we get going, which is why I think this question is important and, and certainly a study that from a feasibility standpoint could be helpful.
So breaking down the patient population in the reface trial, patients were included if they were adult patients, so age 18 years or older, with an unplanned ED admission and sepsis defined by those four criteria that you see there. So suspicion of infection by treating clinician, blood cultures drawn, requiring intravenous antibiotics, or an infection resulting in an increase of SOFA score by at least two points. And so you see SOFA score there, no other score indicated as well. And then those patients also had to have an expected hospital stay greater than 24 hours to be included in the study. As for exclusion criteria, if patients received any amount of fluids of at least 500 mils or greater, they had to be excluded from the study. If they received vasopressors or if they had invasive ventilation prior to screening, they were excluded. They were excluded if they had known or suspected severe bleeding, known or suspected pregnancy, prior enrollment in the trial, or an expected expiration prior to 24 hours. And finally, the interventions as well. So we look at the restrictive fluid arm versus the standard care arm, as you can see here. And this is where I'll mention the hypoperfusion criteria in this particular trial. So fluids were restricted for all the patients in this restrictive IV at fluid administration group, unless they met one of those criteria that you see there, one of those four things. So lactate level of at least four millimoles per liter, and that could be arterial or venous collected. And then looking at hypotension as defined as systolic blood pressure, less than 90 millimeters of mercury, modeling beyond the edge of the kneecap, and then severe oliguria during the first four hours of admission. So those are our hypoperfusion criteria, and we'll talk about those a little bit more when we think about the strengths and limitations of this trial. At any point, a clinician or the physician could give 250 mils of normal saline or lactated ringers if none of those above criteria are met. And if the physician so desired, as long as they gave a reason why they could violate the protocol. And so I'll draw your attention to that in just a little bit as well. As for the standard care group, those patients receive fluids administered at the physician's discretion. So that was just up to the practitioner strictly. For outcomes, the primary outcome of this study being a feasibility trial was the total volume of IV crystalloid fluids administered during the first 24 hours after randomization. And those secondary outcomes included were feasibility measures, uh, and that's total fluid volume at 24 hours as well, and then different measures of mortality in hospital, 30-day mortality, and then 90-day mortality as well. Breaking down this flow chart, you'll see that over 2,400 patients were excluded for various reasons, a lot of them because they met one of those exclusion criteria. but 124 patients ended up being randomized in the trial and allocated to those different treatment groups that we just discussed. That standard care arm did have 62 patients, while the fluid restrictive arm had 61 patients because one actually withdrew their consent prior to analysis in this study. For baseline characteristics, they're pretty well matched across the board, except for I'll draw your attention to the history of comorbidities. You see the DNI and DNR population between groups, so a much higher percentage in the restrictive fluid group versus the standard care group, and then a higher percentage of heart failure patients in the standard care group as compared to restrictive fluids. Uh, so something important to keep in mind as well. As for the primary outcomes, you'll note the mean IV crystalloid fluid volumes that were actually utilized in this study. And that's something that we'll talk about shortly, but you see the statistically significant difference there. So about half a liter on average in that restrictive fluid group versus the standard care group, 1.3 liters. And then you can see it broken down by weight as well per kilogram. So nine mils per kg in the restrictive fluid group and 17 mils per kg in the standard care group compared to our guideline recommended 30 mils per kg. As for the feasibility measures, I included these just so that, you know, for completeness that you guys could see these, but I just did want to draw your uh, attention to those protocol violations. So 21 patients out of those 61 in the restrictive fluid group actually received fluid outside of those hypo hypoperfusion criteria. So that's something to keep in mind, 34% of those patients. And the authors, uh, based on the results of the study, concluded that larger scale randomized trials are feasible for uh, septic patients presenting to the emergency department, and that modifications to their protocol could increase the difference in fluid volume received. As for what I view as the strengths and limitations of this study, I think that there are some strengths certainly here. I mean, I think this is a clinically relevant question and something that um, has been investigated in depth over the last decade or so. And so that's uh, certainly a pertinent clinical question to ask, you know, would more restrictive fluid resuscitation lead to better outcomes for patients, I think is probably the better question and, and something that we'll discuss here in a second. But also the perspective nature of this trial certainly is going to make it a little bit stronger than a retrospective trial. And then looking at limitations for this study, I drew your attention to the protocol violations. So patients did receive more fluid outside of that restrictive fluid arm. So something to keep in mind. 
And then one thing I will point out too is the relatively small fluid volumes administered. I mentioned that 30 mil per kg amount that the Surviving Sepsis Campaign 2021 guidelines would recommend for us. I think that in practice, certainly here at St. Joseph's Candler, many of our patients are going to receive a lot more fluid than what was given on a per weight basis in this particular study. So if you remember again, nine mils per kg in that restrictive fluid group versus 17 mils per kg in the standard care group, which is still much less than what the standard of care would be for us here at our institution. And then I imagine probably uh, at your respective institutions as well. And then thinking more about those hypoperfusion markers too, that the study mentioned in terms of hypoperfusion criteria, if they met them, whether or not a patient would have restricted fluids, they did look at more static measures of hypoperfusion. So they mentioned specifically lactate, they mentioned SOFA score as well. And we know that not one score is necessarily recommended over another. We know that the SERS criteria probably has a stronger pull than the Q SOFA score specifically. That's something to keep in mind too, is that if we're going to, to look at hypoperfusion in patients, uh, those dynamic measures are going to be more effective and, and associated with better outcomes for our patients typically. So leaving you with some final thoughts, I think this study certainly was a feasibility trial, and I think that's what it set out to do. But I do believe that there is some low external validity associated with it due to that median fluid volume that was administered, as well as mean fluid volume administered in this study, too. And as far as clinical applicability goes, I think it does have several limitations that I think make its results a little bit confounding for us as clinicians, and, and certainly something that we we can improve upon moving forward, larger, more prospective trials, examining those outcomes uh, for you know, our clinical outcomes like mortality or, or length of stay and those sorts of things that could be more impactful for us as clinicians. So finally, based on the results of this study, would you consider it feasible to restrict fluid resuscitation for septic patients? See a few maybes. I think that's probably where I land as well right? I think it, it sort of holds up to where we talked about at the beginning with the first poll question in that there are certain clinical scenarios where it may be more impro appropriate for different patient populations, depending on who's presenting in with different comorbidities. But certainly from the results of this study, I'm not overwhelmed by any means in terms of um, whether or not a restrictive fluid resuscitation method would be more effective for patients than a more liberal resuscitation method. So finally, I do want to just give some acknowledgments out to uh, Devin again. Thank you so much for your help with this presentation. Kyle Kelly, thank you for setting everything up, being a moderator today as well. And then my program director as well, uh, Dr. Eric Merritt. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest and should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.